the prescription of a proficiency test for independent directors. Now, an independent director, no matter what his or her background is, qualification is, uh, has to pass a proficiency test which comprises uh, a paper in securities law, a paper in company law, and a paper in basic accountancy. Uh, and once you pass, you get 60% in that. Uh, then it is believed that you are God's gift to the corporate boardroom and that uh, uh, you, you will... Is that add, really true, add, sir? Add yeah. that. No, it's prescribed. It's prescribed, it's ready. Some people are writing out the question papers. I hope they don't make it too difficult. Uh, <laughs> again, again, like you spoke about uh, the separation because you could speak about it objectively, I can also speak about this objectively because those who've done more than 10 years on a board are exempted. <laughs> so, so I'm 10 plus, and I don't have to prove whether I know this or not. It's not important. But I was joking to someone that my successors in uh, SEBI, who headed SEBI after I did, and have therefore done less than 10 years, would all have to take examinations in securities law uh, in order to stay on boards. Is this the answer to getting better directors on boards? Is, not at all. Is, not at all. Uh, I think, sir, the things you're talking about are all, yes. uh, you know, functional knowledge, which is about And India is the first law. country to do it. Yeah. Yes. So I think sometimes innovation is not required. <laughs> uh, it seems. Uh, you just, uh, you know, stick to the trusty old concepts that mm. have come over time, uh, come down over time. I think it's more about a person's track record, his experience, whether his experience is relevant to uh, a part of the company's uh, uh, operations, if not generally overall to uh, the space that the company operates in, in terms of strategy. Uh, in one of our companies, our product mix is changing, uh, and uh, auto, uh, the auto players are going to become more and more important as a customer segment. So we're looking to have a director who has experience in the auto segment, because that's a segment uh, that's new to us. Some of our directors have held the positions of CEOs uh, in, and have a, an, an outstanding record of uh, running companies. Some are specialists, in some cases, depending on uh, the requirement of the company in terms of uh, input. I don't think a test can really, you know, a test for integrity I don't think exists. Uh, any other test is a functional test. I don't think either you or I or most senior people in this room would re remember everything about security law, and I don't think that is uh, required either for someone who's on the board. So I think it's more about the track record uh, and the experience. In fact, and it's relevance to the company that uh, uh, you know, you're appointing he or she to the board on. You know, you have some very distinguished directors on your board, including a distinguished global management guru, who I understand is in the city today. Uh, I don't know whether he's done 10 years, and whether he would, I mean, he's advised the top corporations of the world on how to run their businesses, and um, been on their boards. He's written books that are global bestsellers, I haven't checked with him as he's done 10 years, whether he would get the exemption. But uh, uh, staying on the subject of independent directors, there is one school of thought which believes that over time, this category has not added value in the boardroom, and therefore they're completely dispensable. There's another category which believes that you've got to empower them to be stronger in the boardroom than they are at this point of time. Do people like this need external props to empower them? Aren't they adequately empowered if they see themselves as empowered? Or do you see your independent directors as not contributing what they should be contributing in boardrooms? I would like to think that there's a mixed bag. I mean, there, is, there are some who you know, don't really bring much to the table. There are many others who not just bring their experience uh, to their table, they also will go out of the way to do research or talk to people on topics that uh, the, the board is grappling with. Um, they, uh, many of them play a very effective role of being a conscience keeper to uh, the company. 
and I think that in itself is uh, uh, a very important contribution that many of them make. I think their role in committees is normally very uh, uh, useful, whether it's the audit committee or the finance committee, the nomination and remuneration company. I see that we get some very um, valuable, valuable insights from several of them on these committees. These committees are empowered. Uh, a lot of the things that uh, independent directors talk about, suggest, actually get implemented in a very institutionalized uh, kind of a way. I think the idea of not having independent directors, again, is now a very alien idea uh, in uh, India. There was a time, so you would know better, where you did not require independent directors, maybe in the, up until the mid-80s, I would uh, think. Then there are sort of uh, layers to it in, in several of my contemporaries. Uh, in global companies also have uh, uh, on their board the concept of a lead independent director and his or her role is in a sense even more onerous on his or him or her and also on the company. So I think whilst we're a little away from uh, getting into that kind of uh, nuanced um, segregation of roles, uh, the question of having independent directors I don't think uh, is under debate anymore. 